it's water change time for the fish house on this side and I've just realized I have let my bush get massively out of control it really does need a good old trim. I typically do maintenance on this little nano tank once a month or so. It doesn't need a great deal of attention actually. You can see on the glass that is the extent of the algae, the pest algae growth over the last month. So really quite stable. A lot of it is down to this Calerpa taxifolia keeping the excess nutrients locked up tight within its leaves. We're going to do a little bit of maintenance. I know this tank needs a water change today because of how pale the Blue Octodes has got. This is my indicator basically when I know the nutrient level in the tank's getting pretty low, it goes quite pale. It should look a little bit more like this, quite a deep, vibrant blue. And because I'm doing a water change on my main system today, that is when I like to also do the maintenance on this tank. And I'm going to show you something that people have been asking for quite a while, how to actually trim your Calerpa. Is there a right way of doing it? We're also just going to give the tank a bit of a spruce up because although it is very wild and overgrown, I, um, I like to have it a little bit more under control than this. Obviously everybody has their own preferences when it comes to bush size and shape, but I, um, I feel like mine does need a good trim up. I don't really like to get it out of control to this extent, especially when it's being viewed by thousands of people. We really need to get this bush under control. So it's a little bit complicated because we have got quite a few snail eggs on the glass. You can see them there, there's these little white dots and you can see there's some more up here and these are dove snail eggs. I love dove snails, but they do have this tendency to lay their eggs in the most awkward places. They like flow I found and where there's flow you can see the flow coming through here obviously it's going down the glass and probably up here a little bit as well that's where they tend to lay their eggs I guess it means that there's water movement over their eggs which is obviously good for things isn't it they're gonna get nutrients they're gonna get waste products taken away by the flow so they tend to lay on the front of the glass and that means I can't clean it as thoroughly because I'm not going to be scraping these guys off um, you can see they've been here before, which is why there's this sort of landing strip of green dust algae. So I'm going to carefully go around them with my razor blade. And I've mentioned it in another video, but I really do recommend getting something like this. It's a simple Stanley blade holder. It's used for glass cleaning uh, and it works just as well inside the glass on an aquarium as it does on the outside to remove paint and stuff like that. The one thing about salt water is, of course, it will rust up your blades. Um, but I've bought about 100, I think it is. They're about eight pounds on Amazon. And in the last year, I've used about 50 of them. So cost-wise, it's nothing really to worry about. You do get a couple of goes out of it. I find you get about two to three cleans per blade. As long as you dry them, give them a wash afterwards, then you tend to be okay. And that's all I'm doing with this. It won't scratch the glass. I know a lot of people are worried when it comes to using razor blades sometimes about scratching the glass and that's not going to happen. The one thing you do have to worry about though is getting your blade caught in the silicone and I have actually done this a few times in this glass. I haven't gone all the way through but if you go too far you are at risk obviously of breaking your silicone and then you're going to have a leak and then your tank's knackered basically so we just want to be really careful about that. So when it comes to trimming we're going to be reasonably aggressive with this Calerpa. It's Calerpa taxifolia. It's pretty hardy. It is, I think, one of the most invasive species. It's all over the place. I think in Florida and other parts of American coastline, this stuff is causing havoc in the local environment because it only takes a tiny little segment to survive or get over from wherever on a ship hull or some aquarist who doesn't know any better, chucks it in the ocean and it just takes over. So with this particular species, you don't really need to be that careful with how you cut it up. You can use a pair of scissors, which I find a bit easier, or you can just rip it with your hands, which feels wrong, but it is something that you can do. Um, it has got runners though. So the best way to remove it is actually just to cut off the runner. So if we look down in the base here, you'll see what I mean. It has these here. Big long roots and they are all in the substrate. But if we just pick them apart and they're quite tough, I just use my fingers to grasp them and then just tug them apart. 
can see it's going to be quite messy because they are quite tightly bound to the substrate. You can end up removing quite large pieces in one go and look that's almost that whole section. But I don't want to remove all of it because it is doing a job in here with regards to keeping my tank balanced. We just want to remove this large piece that is obstructing the view and the runner goes really quite far back. I'm just tugging it, pulling it until we release it. Quite a large portion removed already, isn't it? That's quite a lot. So I'm not going to waste it. I'm going to chuck it into this tank and then we don't have to throw it away because I always find it's a bit of a shame to throw macroalgae away. All that lovely growth, all that time we've spent growing it, chucking it in the bin isn't the best situation. So where else do we need to trim? We've definitely cleared up quite a bit of space now, but I don't think I want it up the sides there because it might be obstructing my little surface skimmer. So again, we'll just pull it away and it's pretty easy to do. You just snap it. When you do snap it, you'll notice that it does leak fluid and that's just the inside of its um, cell structure. Clerper is all one cell, which is insane to think about, but it is just one cell. So they're very leaky when you rip them. Again, you could use scissors, but you're gonna get the same result. The idea behind this is I actually do want to see the rest of my tank. It's kind of obstructing my view to the rest of the macroalgae. So the next bit, I'm actually just gonna cut the leaves with the pair of scissors that I showed you. You might think this is a bit aggressive, but it's totally fine. And I'll show you why in a second. But you can just literally grab the leaves. And again, they will leak fluid, but that's okay. And we'll just get all the little bits that I've missed. So I think that looks a little bit better. It's a bit easier to see everything in here now. And I did mention why it's okay to cut the leaves. And I'll just pick this bit off here and show you, because it's easier to show you. If you look at this bit of um, taxifolia leaf that I must have cut off ages ago, you can see that it's able to grow new stems or runners from the leaf itself. And that's because it is all one cell. So it basically detects what it needs. And in this case, it realized it was just a little bit of leaf floating about. And it thought to itself in its little macroalgae brain that it needs a runner now so that it can attach itself to a substrate or a rock and continue its growth. And that's basically what's happened here. And that's why whenever you do fragment up um, any Calerpa species, you've got to run the risk of this happening. If you don't want it in certain parts of your tank, you might be surprised that it only takes a tiny little section of loose Calerpa and you'll have this happening which is it basically spreading and this is why this particular species is so dangerous in certain parts of the ocean. The next part of my cleaning routine is just to completely 100% drain this tank. That goes against a lot of people's methodology especially people who keep lots of corals but I found this is one of the best ways of water changing macroalgae. They really don't care if you change 100% of their water, as long as the salinity and the temperature is essentially the same as the water you're taking out. As you can see, I wasn't joking when I said I take 100% of my water out, or let's say 98% of my water out. And it actually looks quite nice when it's been drained. You can see the different textures are a bit easier of the mackerel. It looks like a little salad bowl, doesn't it? But um, I wouldn't really want to eat anything in here. One thing you do have to worry about, or I have to worry about at least, is it, the things drying out because they do dry out quite quickly and it is warm in this shed. Fortunately, this auto top up, um, which I've had on here for a while now, does a great job of refilling this tank. It takes it straight out of my freshly water changed system. So I know the water that's going in here has a bit of refreshment to it. It's got all the nutrients and things that this macroalgae needs. We're a bit bubbly after the water change. You always get a little bit of oxygen coming out of the water when you do a water change. You can see it in freshwater planted tanks. Always happens every single time. But I think this looks so much better. I can actually see 
my macro algae now. I can see the cryptonemia at the back, I can see the little yellow goby, and obviously everything is a little bit pale, but I explained that that's because we were running out of nutrients, hence the water change. In a couple of days time, this will all regain its nice deep coloration and will be ready for the next water change in a week or two. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, leave me a like and also subscribe to my channel. Well, once again, thanks for watching and happy fish keeping.